Okay, now we're recording. So we finished off with this example, but we didn't quite complete it. Um, what we did was we isolated the radical by moving the eight over. And then we went ahead and um, tried to get rid of the radical by applying the index here. Since it was a hidden index, it's automatically two. So then we applied that two power to both sides. On this side, it ends up canceling out the house. So we're just left with the nine X plus 27. On this side though, we actually had to FOIL that out, okay? And I don't think I addressed it in the last class, but I do wanna make sure that I mention it. Um, I was looking for a sharpener in the classroom. Um, but you never wanna just square each term individually, okay? There is a rule that says if you're multiplying two things together, you can square them individually. But there is no rule that if you have a plus or a minus in between, that you could just square them individually. Okay, there's no rule such as that. So be very, very careful because I do get people who want to do that. Okay, they want to just square each one. And if you do that, notice that you would only get 2x squared, which is 4x squared, and 4 squared, which is 16. You wouldn't even have these middle guys. You'd be missing them completely. Okay, and so then your, your answer would be just wrong. So make sure that if you do have two terms that are squared, that you don't try to apply a rule that doesn't exist, okay? You do have to write it out twice and then distribute it out, okay? So we did do that though. We wrote it out twice and then we took this one and distributed it to the second one. Then we took the plus four and distributed it to the second one as well. Some of you do that process like FOIL, right? Some of you also do, yeah, it's like foil. So you do first, then outer, then inner, then the last two. Um, it's the same process. You'll still end up with the same uh, step here, okay? Um, from there, what we did was, instead of trying to combine these eight Xs, we said, well, remember the end game. The end game is we have to get it um, equal to zero. So instead, we went ahead and minus the nine X on both sides, and we minus the 27 on both sides. I just like to conveniently write the minus nine X under the other X's. And then I like to write the minus 27 constant under the other constant, okay? So that when I put them together, I only have the four X squared. These guys, when we stuck them in the calculator, it came out to positive seven. So I have positive seven X's. And then when we did these in the calculator, we ended up with um, minus 11, okay? From here, we identified the A, the B, and the C so that we could go ahead and use our um, quadratic formula. So from here, we're gonna do the quadratic formula. Now I did, I'm in another classroom because I, I think I mentioned to you guys, right? Like you hear everybody in my office. <laughs> so, and then I talk loud. So I didn't want to be disturbing anyone or anyone disturbing us. I didn't want you hearing anybody in the background. So I moved to this classroom. Um, but when I came up here, I forgot my little pouch of pens. So I'm gonna, my, my office is literally right underneath me. I'm gonna go run down and grab my pouch of pens and let you guys, um, some of you are still logging in and such to get you, let you get settled. And then I'll be right back with my pens, okay? I'm gonna pause the recording in the meantime so it's not just stagnant. Okay, so I do have the formula here. Some of you may have already started trying to plug it in, but I'm gonna go ahead and do that now. So B is seven, and then B again is seven, but squared, minus four times A, which is four, times C, which is negative 11. And the whole thing over two times four. Okay. So remember, the, we don't want to type the whole radical, just what's inside, just to make sure that it's not negative. So let's see, 7 squared minus 4 times 4 times negative 11. And it's not a negative number, so that's a good. That means we don't have any of those imaginaries, right? Any of the i's. And 2 times 4 at the bottom is just 8. And I do believe that 
square root of 25 is a nice number. So let's do square root and then 225. And it is, it's 15. So we have negative seven plus 15. And notice it does not have a house anymore. So when you write it down, be sure not to put it in a house. That happens, it happens a lot actually. Students will do the square root, but then leave the radical on it, okay? Just be careful not to do that. I don't know why it's a common thing that people do, but it is, it happens a lot. <laughs> so once you have this, since everybody's nice little numbers, right? No I's, no radicals, everybody's pretty simple. We're gonna separate it into one with the plus and then one of them with the minus. And so then let's see what I get for this first fraction. So negative seven plus 15 over eight. Oh, and that one simplifies down to just positive one. But if I do the same thing for the other one with the minus in the middle, let's see, I'm gonna copy that. And then I just wanna change the plus sign to a minus sign and hit enter. That one's a fraction, negative 11 over four. So remember, these are our proposed solutions, right? So these are possible solutions. We don't know if they're actual solutions until we try to check them. So when we try to check them, we have to plug them into the original equation, which is the one I have there in the pencil, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plug in the first X value, which is one, here for X and see what number I get on the left-hand side. Then I'm gonna plug in one for X over here and see what I get on the right-hand side. If the two sides end up being the same number, then one is a solution. But if the two sides end up giving me different numbers, then one is not a solution. Or if I get that error message, right? So let's go ahead and check one first. Let's first plug it in on the left side. So square root nine, and I'm gonna plug in one plus 27. And then I need to put the minus eight outside the radical. So I need to make sure I hit the right arrow. And then notice how there's no more house above the, um, what do they call this, a cursor? So there's no house above my cursor. I can just hit minus eight. And then let's see what we get. Okay, so we get negative two on that side. Now let's go plug in one over here. Oops, two parentheses one, subtract four, and I get the same thing. So this one works, this is good. This one is good. Now we have to go check the other one. So let's see, second square root nine, but this time in the parentheses, I have to plug in negative 11 over four, and then close it and then the plus 27. And then I have to get out of the house to do the minus eight. So out of the house, minus eight, and I get this number. It doesn't matter what number it is, I just wanna make sure I get the same number when I plug it into the other side. So now we'll plug it in there. Two parentheses, negative 11 over four, close my parentheses, minus four and hopefully it's negative 13 over two as well. Ooh, it's not, okay? So this time it did not work, the second one. I just wanna make sure I plug that one in there correct. Yep, 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 I did, I did. Okay, so this one is not the one that works. So when you write your final answer, if it just has X equals, you'll just type in one in the box. But again, if it asks you for that solution set, then you just put the one inside the braces, right? But there's only one answer that happens to be the number one, but <laughs> there's only one answer because the other one did not check out. Okay, now for example six, we're still doing radicals, but now they've thrown in a cube root, which we haven't done yet. We've only done square roots, okay? 
but the process is still going to be exactly the same. Our first step is when we're doing radicals is to always get the radical, at least one of them by themselves. And right now, neither one of these guys is by themselves, okay? So since we're subtracting this radical, if I wanna move that radical over, I would have to add that radical on both sides of the equal sign. So that when I do that, I will have this house And then this one's now gone. And then zero plus anything is the same thing, right? It's not gonna change that value. Once you have at least one house by itself, we got lucky because both of the houses are by themselves, right? But at least one house is by itself. Then you can do this step where you apply the index as a power on both sides. And this time my index is not invisible. It's very visible, right? For both of these, it has a three index. So what we'll do is we'll apply a three power on both sides. Now this one's nice because since both of them had the three radical and now both of them have the three exponent, it actually cancels out both of the radicals. And so all we're left with is just the stuff on the inside. And once I look at that equation, I do see the x squared. So I know it's a quadratic. And so then I have to get it equal to zero. So I'm gonna, there's only one guy over here to move. So I'm gonna move him that way. So I'm gonna subtract him because it's positive. So I'm gonna do the opposite. If I have an x, I'm gonna take away an x. And then I'm gonna do the same thing here with the like term. So if I had an X and I took it away, now I have nothing. Let me slide this up. And over here, the four X squared is still there, but these are like terms. I'll use a pencil. These are like terms. So negative four take away one is actually negative five. So I have negative five X's. And then my constant doesn't have any constants to add with it. So it's just gonna come down. And then from here, we're doing the same quadratic formula. So we're getting lots of practice with that quadratic formula, right? So here the A is equal to the number in front of X squared. B is the number in front of X, which is actually a negative five. And then C is the constant, which is a positive one. <clears throat> so then let's see my little paper again. We're gonna plug it into this thing. So I do have it looking like this. I already identified my A, B, and C, and I'm gonna plug it into this formula. So we get X equals negative of B, but B itself is a negative five. Then B needs to be squared, which means negative five is being squared, minus four times A times C all over two times A. Now I can do the little parts, but I can't do the big radical part yet. So I know a negative times a negative will give me positive five, and I know that two times four will give me eight but I do need to figure out what I'm gonna have inside that house. So let's see. Um, parentheses, negative five squared, then minus four, parentheses four, parentheses one. Oh, and I get nine, that's nice. So I can take the square root of nine, no problem. It's just three. I'm running out of paper here, so I'm gonna go to the side. So five plus or minus three, no more house. And since everybody's a nice number, no I's, no radicals, we're just gonna split it and do five plus three over eight, and then five minus three over eight. And just for speed purposes, I'm gonna put both of those in here. 
So five plus three over eight, that's one. And then five minus three over eight turns out to be one fourth. So again, those are my proposed solutions. We don't know yet if they are actual solutions. Now, this problem is pretty, it's, I mean, it's kind of weird to check, but easy in a way, because normally you would have to plug in your number on both sides, right? But since there's really nothing over here, you just have to plug your numbers into this side and hope that it equals zero when you hit enter on the calculator, okay? If it does equal zero, then it checks out. But if it doesn't equal zero, then it does not check out. So bear with me, I'm gonna to try to put all of that in here. Now I'm gonna do the more complicated one first and then I'll do the easy one. So I'm actually gonna check the one fourth first. Just because this is a lot to type in, <laughs> I don't wanna to have to do it the whole thing all over again. Now, here's something new. We have not done cube roots in our calculator yet, okay? But if you see where I'm pointing with my pin, there's like this little hat button or it's called the carrot. This is what allows you to put exponents. So if I wanted to do six to the power seven, that's the button you would use for powers, right? We have this one for squares, but any other powers you would use this button, okay? And just like you use this button, the square button, you shift and then you square to get a square root. Well, you're gonna shift and hit this button to get other kinds of roots, okay? The only thing is, is that you have to tell me what kind of root you're gonna put in there before you click that button. So since I want the cube root, I'm gonna to have to hit three. And then when I push second and this button, it's gonna happen real fast. So I want you to see it. But when you hit it, it's gonna pop that three real tiny as an index, okay? So it's not a big three anymore. It's like a little index. And then I can start typing away. So four parentheses, um, one over four, close it, square it, minus four parentheses, one over four, close, plus one. Now I need to get out of the house because this minus sign is not inside of a house, okay? So I need to hit over and then my minus sign. And now I can try to type in this one. So three first, then second, and the power button and it makes it a little index. And then I could type the one fourth again. And so hopefully after I push enter, it will come out to zero. If not, it just means that one fourth was not a solution, okay? And I do get zero, nice. So that one is a solution. Now we're gonna go try one. So I'm just gonna copy this and then delete all the, the mess. So I'm gonna hit second and left. What happens when I hit second and left is it goes all the way to the front. So if I go that way, see how it takes me to the very front? And then I can just go here and say delete, delete, and just type in the one. Delete, oops, I the wrong delete button. Gotta get there first. Then delete, delete and type in one. And now inside the other house, delete, delete, and type in one. And now everything's got one plugged in and I'll hit enter again. Oh, and I get zero as well, perfect. So this one had two solutions. So our answers in the computer will be X equals one and one fourth with a comma. Or again, if they want the solution set, it'll just be one and one fourth. Or the one fourth first and then the one. It doesn't matter which, which one you put in front or back. Just as long as both are there. Okay, so are there any questions about the radical so far? So it just has those three key steps, right? So you get one of the radicals by itself, whatever the little index is, you apply it on both sides, you do all your math, 
and then if it's a linear equation at the end, you solve it. If it's a quadratic equation at the end, then you might need to use that quadratic formula. Okay. Um, so that's the end of the radicals, but we still have one more concept in 1.6, which is rational exponent equations. So we did rational equations, which was fraction equations. We've done radicals equations, right? Now we're going to do rational exponent equations. So I'm going to turn this page over so you can see what that looks like. Okay. So this one is equation with rational. Remember, rational just means fraction, right? So we're going to have equations with fraction exponents. And so that first sentence says, an equation with a rational exponent contains a variable or a variable expression. So it has a variable like the letter X or a variable expression like X minus four raised to an exponent that is a rational number. So whether it just be X raised to a fraction power or a whole expression with X raised to a fraction power. Those are both considered uh, rational exponent equations, okay? Now, I think I've brought this up before, but I just wanted to make sure that we talk about it again because we're definitely going to be using this, okay? Now, what I have to tell people though is that um, you will convert it over to a radical form because we know how to solve radical equations, okay? And then it says, if you're applying exponents on both sides where the denominator is even, then you must use plus or minus. And I'll talk about why in a minute, okay? Um, so the rule for rational exponents, it's kind of like the rule for the radicals. There was some stuff going on behind the scenes when we were solving those radicals. And I'm gonna kind of briefly discuss it. Okay, so when you were solving an equation like this, let's say it said the cube root of x equal to, I don't know, two. <clears throat> what we were doing was we were saying whatever that power is, you're going to apply it to both sides. Right? Okay. We also had a problem like this where if you had x squared equal to four, in order to get rid of the square, you had to do the square root on both sides. But with the square root, there was something extra happening. With the square root, we had to remember to use plus or minus. Okay. And so I'm actually going to write the radicals as exponents. And then you'll see what happens and why I'm gonna apply the same notion to these radical equations, okay? Using this same rule, okay? This house could have been written as X to the one third. I don't think I needed to put it in parentheses, but I think those were in red. Because x to the one third is the same exact thing as the cube root of x. There's no exponent there, so it's an invisible one. And then the index goes in the denominator. Same thing here, right? The exponent goes in the numerator and the index goes in the denominator. And then when you apply the three power on both sides, well, what's one third times three? you're just gonna get x to the one power, which we don't write x to the one power, we just write x, okay? Similarly over here, if I were to write this red radical as an exponent, that would be one half. And the same thing here, one half. And again, two times one half is just gonna give you one power, but you don't write the one power. 
And we automatically know that when we do plus or minus on the square roots, right? So this is what's going on behind the scenes. You only have to do plus or minus if you're doing a square root, a fourth root, a sixth root, any even index. You have to put in the plus or minus, okay? And the reason is, is because of the signs, right? If you're multiplying two numbers together, um, those two numbers could be positive and in you get a certain number after you square it, or those two numbers could be negative and you would still get the same result when you square it, okay? Even if there's four of them, if all four are positive, I could get a positive result. If all four were negative, I would still get a positive result, okay? So it only applies to the evens. When you have odd radicals and you try to apply an odd radical, like a cube root on both sides, you don't have to worry about putting plus or minus because there's three of them, right? To get you whatever number. So if that number is positive, then you're gonna use positive. If the number is negative, it's gonna be negative. There's no plus or minus when you apply a cube root on both sides, okay? So the root part comes from this denominator, doesn't it? Isn't that what gives me what kind of root I'm taking, right? So if I'm going to be applying an even radical, then I have to use the plus or minus, okay? It's from that same notion when we were applying the square roots before. So always make sure that if you're the little exponent denominator, oh, I spelled exponent wrong. I forgot a T. So if the exponent denominator is even, use plus or minus, okay? Now the trick is for these problems, and they didn't give us a box to tell us what to do or nothing, okay? The trick is to apply the reciprocal exponent on both sides. So if this, and I know it's real tiny, I'm gonna write it bigger because it's really, really tiny, but it does say to the three-fifths power, okay? So if I wanna solve this, I need to flip that three-fifths and apply the power five over three. And whatever I do on this side, I have to do the same thing on the other side. But notice that the denominator on that exponent is three and three is not an even number, right? So we don't have to worry about the plus or minus in the next step because the denominator is not even, okay? Now over here, what happens when you multiply these exponents together is you're gonna get what, 15 over 15, which is just one, but I don't need to write the one exponents. And on the other side, luckily we have this doodad, um, we can just type all of that in there. So I'm gonna do parentheses, 27, close a parentheses. Remember that button we talked about earlier for powers? I'm gonna hit that power button. And then I need a fraction, five fraction three. Let me get down from there. And it looks pretty much like what I have on my paper, right? I have 27 and then it's power, is five over three. So I'm gonna hit enter and it gives me this number, 243. In all of these equations, just like the fraction equations, just like the radical equations, we have to check our answers, okay? So we're gonna plug this 243 inside the original raise it to the three-fifths power, and hopefully it equals 27. Now, this one was pretty straightforward, so I'm pretty sure it's going to check out. We'll do it anyway, okay? So I'm going to plug in 243, and I'm going to raise it to the three-fifths power. And let's see if when I plugged in that 243, if I get 27. And I do. So this one does work.
Now we'll try the same thing on the other one, okay? And you know, this stuff with the little exponent is already all by itself, so I don't have to worry about anything. I'm just gonna take the whole left side. And if you can't see that, because again, it's real tiny, it's two over three. So if I wanna get rid of the two over three, I have to flip it and do three over two. And whatever I did to that side, I have to do the exact same thing to the other side. So what's gonna happen is I'm gonna end up with X minus four, and then that'll be six over six, which is just one, right? And then over here, I'm not sure, let's see. 16 raised to the power three over two. And we get 64. Now we don't have to write one powers, do we? And if there's if we don't write a power up there, then there's really no need for these parentheses if there's no power up there. Okay. So we really don't have to write that one or the parentheses. And then if I'm solving that, I just have to add four to both sides. Oh, but I missed something. What did I miss? Four as a square root. Mm -hmm. When you do, it says here, right? If the exponent denominator is even, what do I have to do? I have to use plus or minus. Wasn't this exponent denominator that I applied over here have a two? Is it two even? So when I found this 64, I have to put plus or minus 64. That's how you apply the rule. So only the exponent in red do I need to see if there's a, an even in the denominator. Because that's the exponent I'm applying, right? So this is actually not just 64, but it's actually positive and negative 64. So I actually have two things I need to calculate here. I need to do positive 64 plus four, but then I also need to do negative 64 plus four. So there's two answers here. So that one will give me 68, and then this one will give me negative 60. And we definitely need to check. Now, I know I scribbled all over the original equation, but imagine that my red stuff is not there, okay? We're gonna plug in 68 here, do the whole works, and hopefully it comes out to 16. And then we'll go in and we'll plug in negative 60 in there, do this whole operation and hopefully that one will equal 16. So let me clear this out, parentheses, 68 minus four, close the parentheses, and then I need to raise it to the power two over three. And that's all I need to enter. So I'm gonna hit enter and hopefully it's 16. This one is, good. So this one works. Now we'll try negative 60. So parentheses, negative 60 minus four, close it, raise it to the two over three and hit enter. And that one is, comes out to be 16. So both of them check out. Now, if I had forgotten to put the plus or minus, the computer would have told me there's another answer. Because if I did not put the plus or minus, I would have only gotten this answer the 68. I would have never had that one. And so the computer recognizes that and they would have said, oh, there's another solution. And if it says something to that degree, try to remember to put the plus or minus, okay? Because you'll be missing one guy if you don't do it. Okay, the last, last concept, and this is really just a replay of the substitution that I showed you in the last, I forgot how many sections ago it was, but um, we did one kind of like this. And so really we're just gonna get practice with another one. Um, but it tells us that if you have quadratics 
or a problem that is in quadratic form, then you can still solve those kinds of quadratics. Now they tried to do something crazy on us with this expression, you know, but we don't have problems like that. So I crossed it out. Like we do not see that in this class. They tried to do another one like this, but again, we don't have these problems with the negative exponents, okay? But, and we've already done one very similar. We did one like this before, okay? We do have problems like this. And so we're just getting an extra practice with this kind of problem, okay? Um, it always says though, when you're using substitution, um, always remember, um, what does it say here? When using a substitution variable and solving an equation that is in quadratic form, do not forget the step that gives a solution in terms of the original variable. That's just a fancy math way of saying, don't forget to back substitute, okay? So if you say, you know, X is equal to some other letter, don't forget at the end, after you've solved for that other letter, that you go back and put what, what that letter represented, okay? So for us, I think the trick back when we were doing it was whatever this middle guy is, right? You always have AX squared plus BX plus C. So whatever this middle guy is, that's the X. That's the guy who's acting like X. And so that's the one that you let it be some other variable. Now, a quadratic equation looks like this in terms of x. It could be in terms of z if you wanted it to be. It could be in terms of, um, I think they use u. A lot of times the book will use u. It doesn't matter what letter is there, just like it doesn't matter if there's an expression there, okay? But the one in the middle is always gonna be the one that gives you that single variable, okay? So when I'm looking at this, that single guy there in the middle, that's the one that's gonna be you. So I'm gonna say, let u equal x squared. Then if u is x squared, what is u squared? That's like applying a square on both sides. So what do I get if I do x squared squared? Anybody know? What is x squared squared? Is it just x? Not quite. You're thinking like with the, the square root and then the square, those will undo each other. But we have both exponents. So think of this rule. If you have an exponent raised to another exponent, you actually have to multiply those exponents. So it's to the power of four. Right. According to that rule, then there would be four. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Thank you both for contributing. Um, now here is where we actually do the substitution. So I'm gonna try to use colors here. So I already have green for you. And then this guy is gonna be u squared, isn't it? Okay. So we end up with 12 and the x to the fourth becomes u squared. I don't want to put 12 in green. So this becomes 12 u squared minus 11 u is in green plus 2 equal to 0. You can't even tell the difference between blue and green. Sorry. <laughs> These pins are too close in color. How about this? I have red. So the u will be the x squared. So that means that's the u. 
And then the x to the four is u squared. And so that's why we have u squared instead of the x to the fourth. But now that it looks like this, it literally fits a quadratic definition. You got a squared variable, a regular variable, and then a constant, right? And so you can do your quadratic formula with that. Your A would just be the number in front of the squared variable. Your B would be the number in front of the regular variable, which is negative 11. And then your C is still the constant, which is positive two. So that's a big, big, big note here. Always let u equal the middle variable expression, whether it's x squared, you know, they tried to do something else earlier. Like here, look, it's x to the negative one. I think on the other page, it had like something in parentheses. Whatever's there in the middle, that's going to be your u. Don't use the number because the number is going to come into play here, right? Don't use the number in front, just the expression with the variable. Oops, sorry, I was making sure I was recording. I thought for a split second, <laughs> I didn't resume the recording, but we did, so we're good. So let's go ahead and plug this into our equation. Oh, but we have a little bit of an issue. Oops, my motion detector turned off. If it doesn't sense me moving in here, it just turns off all the lights. Okay, we're in a little sticky go. Here it is. So again, let's notice something. Notice that this was my expression and it was in terms of X's, wasn't it? Mine is in terms of U's. So when you go to write your quadratic, make sure you use the correct letter here. Okay, again, that middle term is the one that's getting used, right? So my middle one is a U. So that means u equals all of this stuff we're about to type in, okay? So it'll be negative b, which is negative 11, plus or minus, then negative 11 again, but squared, minus, move that up, four times a times c, all over two times a. I'm going to do this computation, a double negative will turn it to positive 11. And 2 times 12 is 24. But what I need to figure out is what's inside that house. So negative 11 squared minus 4 times A times C ends up being 25, which is positive again. So I don't have any I's. And a square root of 25 is a nice number. It's just regular five. So this will be 11 plus or minus five over 24. So then we have the two fractions. One with plus five and then one with minus five, right? So let me see, fraction 11 plus five at the top and 24 at the bottom. It simplified it to 2 thirds. And then 11 minus 5 on the top and 24 at the bottom. And this one gave me 1 fourth. Okay. Now remember, this is u. u equals 2 thirds and 1 fourth. Okay. But is that what they're asking me to solve for? They didn't even give us u's, did they? So we're definitely, we're never asked to solve for u. We were asked to solve for x, okay? This is that little paragraph that they were mentioning up there. Don't forget to back substitute, okay? So it means great, we found out that u was these two nice numbers, but let's remember what u was, right? u was actually x squared. 
So we have to say that x squared equals 2 thirds and x squared equals 1 fourth. Now, do we remember how to get rid of a square? We kind of mentioned it earlier. We're in the house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You got it. Do the house. So we have to have a square root on both sides, right? And when we do a square root, we have to have the plus or minus. But yes, that will get rid of the power and I will just have X all by itself. And now let's see what that looks like. Clear square root. And then I'm gonna type two over three. And then I'm gonna hit enter. Oh, that's not good. Okay, your calculator doesn't like you to enter it as a fraction. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna apply this rule that says if you have a house over a fraction, you can apply that house to both the top and the bottom separate. And then your calculator should do it. So let's see if it will do it now. So I'm gonna hit fraction first this time. And then I'm gonna do square root of two on the top and then do square root of three at the bottom. And hopefully it gives me an exact answer and not this weird decimal. There we go, that's what I was trying to get to, okay? So if you try to put this in the calculator and gives you decimal, just split it and do the house on both and then it should give you the exact answer. So we get square root of six over three. One of them's positive and one of them's negative. Now I'm gonna do the same thing here since I already know my lesson, right? It's gonna give me an issue. So I'm just gonna hit fraction and square root of the top over square root of the bottom. Looks exactly like it should. And that one's one half, nice. Now, how many answers did we get? Do we have two answers? Proposed answers, not actual answers. We haven't gotten that far yet. Doesn't this one represent two separate numbers? And that one represents two separate numbers, right? So we actually have four solutions. I'm just trying to get you to notice something because this is gonna come up later when we get to chapter three, okay? But whatever your power is here, you're always gonna have that many solutions or less, okay? Truly, you have that many solutions, period. But sometimes you have a repeated solution and when you're doing the math, it doesn't, it doesn't show you that this solution works twice, okay? But we will see something later that will show us that that solution worked twice, okay? And sometimes you can have solutions that are imaginary that you might not necessarily see in a graph, okay? So there's lots of stuff going on. But whenever you have an equation, whatever that highest power is on X, that is going to be how many answers you should get, okay? Um, it's just sometimes when we do the algebra of it, we don't always see all four answers. We got really lucky here that we got to see all four answers. There was no imaginary business going on. There was no hidden extra solutions going on. It was very straightforward. Now, what I do have to do is I have to unfortunately check all four of these answers, right? So we're going back to the original equation up at the top. And we're gonna start off with the weird one here. I'm gonna start with the negative because the negative is harder to type in. And then when I have to do the positive, all I have to do is delete the negative, right? So let's go try to plug these in. So to the original, it's 12 and I'm gonna plug in the negative square root of six over three first. So negative fraction square root of six over three close the parentheses, and I'm raising that to the fourth power. So raise 
to the fourth power. Come down, minus 11 parentheses, negative fraction, square root of six, go to the bottom, hit three, go to the side, close it, and I have to square it. So I do have just a square button. I don't need to do power two, although you could do that as well. I'm just gonna hit the square button, but I still have to do plus two. Hopefully that comes out to zero, right? So if I hit enter, let's see if it comes out to zero. Ah, it does. So the negative version works. Now let's try the positive version. So if I go here, I'm just gonna do second and go to the front. And all I'm gonna do is delete the little negative. I'm not gonna do nothing else because it's exactly the same other than the negative. Okay, and then I'm gonna hit enter again. And that one also works. So both of these weird ones work. Now we gotta go back in and try this one. And I'm gonna do the same thing again. I'm gonna try the negative one first so that when I go back, all I have to do is delete the negative. This one's a little bit not so crazy to plug in. So 12 parentheses, one over two, go to the side, close it, and then raise to the fourth, hit down, minus 11, open parentheses, one over two. And I said I was gonna enter the negative one and I didn't, it's okay. I'll show you how to put the negative in there. Close it, square it, and then plus two. So I'm actually checking the positive one half, right? And I get zero. Now here it's a little bit weird, but we can still put the negative in, the, in there. When I went in the parentheses, it automatically put me in this space between the parentheses and the one half. So I don't need to like second insert a negative. All I have to do is just type the negative and it automatically puts it in the front. It's only because it's a fraction. If it was not a fraction, I would have to hit second insert and then the negative. Now, when I go to the right, again, it puts me in that space between the parentheses and before the fraction. So I'm just gonna type in the negative. And I get zero as well. So then all of them are answered. So we've got four answers. We have square root of six over three, negative square root of six over three, one half and negative one half. But all four of these answers are our solutions. So this is this, I mean, this is the second time we've done a problem like this, except the first time we did it, we factored that instead of using the quadratic formula. Okay. But now you have two ways to do the same sort of problem. Okay. But you definitely need to remember this part to get going. I have a question. Sure. So since the middle variable will never be higher than the first variable, if mm -hmm. the first variable would have been x to the power of six would u equal um, x squared to the third power? I'm it sorry. would have been yes. that, right. If this was the third power, this one would have been six. The one in the front will always be double what that one is. Notice here, right, you have a negative one power. If I double it, isn't it negative two, right? So yeah, you're onto that, that's perfect. I'm glad you noticed. Now we don't go with all that. <laughs> we won't do all of those, but <laughs> I'm glad you see the pattern. <laughs> okay, I think that was the end of this section. I mean, it was a big one, so it's not <laughs> no easy feat. Um, it was pretty difficult that one. It was a lot of stuff in there. But now you should be able to go through the 1.6 assignment and you should have enough examples to figure all of those out, okay? If you get stuck on them, um, or if you're just having trouble or you, you know, whatever the situation is, you can always take a picture of your problem you're working on and then whatever you've done on paper and I can help you figure out where it went wrong or what's going on, okay? Um, so definitely, definitely take advantage of that, okay? Um, for the rest of class, we only have about 15 minutes, so I might be able to introduce like one concept and then, you know, maybe do like one example, but that's okay. 
um, we'll just go as far as we can. I do have it scheduled in the um, the new timeline that we'll probably not finish this and we'll finish it up with tomorrow. I think I broke up 2.3 and 5.2 into two days just because we kind of overlap a little bit with 1.6, okay? But 2.3 is next and 2.3 is different. Everything that we've been doing so far has been all about like solving equations, okay? All kinds of equations. Um, we were we were factoring, and the only reason why we were factoring is so that we could apply that method to solving equations. Um, and then we learned a whole bunch of other things, like the square root property, and I mean, Gobbs, the quadratic formula, all kinds of stuff. Okay, but now we're going to take a little bit of a break from solving, and this is more like theoretical. Okay. So now we're talking about something called functions, okay? So normally your equations, you've always seen them like this. I don't wanna write A, I'll just put a number. Like five X squared plus seven X minus three, right? You always seen the equations like this, okay? What they're going to get into now is what's called function notation. So from now on, we're not gonna be referring to equations like this or expressions like this, okay? What you'll see from now on is this kind of thing. Okay? Um, and ideally, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Y is the same as f of x. This, I always use these words, this is a fancy way of saying y. Okay, you're basically asking for, and I, I'm sorry for the language, but it's the function value at this particular x, okay? Well, when you're looking at a graph or you're looking at an equation, when you ask me for the function value, you're asking me for that y value, okay? Um, a good way to put it is that x is like the input and y is like the output, okay? And this, the function, is like what you're putting the x into and how you're getting that y as an output, okay? So I always call this like the machine, right? You put the x in the machine, you do all the computations, and then out comes the y, okay? It's that same kind of um, process. So when we talk about functions, though, it allows us to start looking at um, graphs, okay? So a lot of the chapter two stuff that we do, and even the chapter three, just oh gosh for the rest of the semester actually we're always going to be using this f of x okay um and it's just y it's a fancy way of saying y the reason why they use f of x is because later you might have different variables and different names like if i have two two equations right this one and then this one how do I tell the difference? If I tell you to plug one of those inside the other, how do I tell you which one goes inside which one, right? Uh, they have to have different names. They can't both be Y. <laughs> so instead of doing this, saying this is Y1 and this one is Y2, what they do instead is they call this one Frank and then they call this one Gary, okay? And so what letter they choose to use here really does not matter. They could use F, they could use G, they could use H, I've seen K, I've seen all kinds of letters, okay? Normally it's F. And the reason why they normally use F is because of the word function, okay? But if there's more than one function, they will start using other letters just to distinguish between one function and another, okay? But let's first wrap our mind around this whole function idea, like what makes it a function, okay? Because there are some, some equations, these are both functions. Once I tell you the definition, these are actually functions. But you will get into some stuff like, um, oh gosh, I'm trying to think of something that is not a function. Oh, like this equation. This equation is not a function. I will talk about why later, but it is not a function, okay? Um, so we need to figure out what is a function. And we'll talk about that in this little box down here, okay? So there's a difference between a function and a relation, 
This is a relation. It relates x to y. x is obviously whatever y is squared, right? Here, this is a relation. Um, whatever x is, if I multiply it by 2 and I add 3, I'll be able to figure out what y is, right? There's a relationship going on between the x and the y. You could do something to one guy and end up with the other one, okay? Those are called relations. And it says one quantity can sometimes be described in terms of another quantity, such as the letter grade a student receives in a mathematics course depends on a numerical score, okay? Whether it be the test score, homework score, whatever it is, there's some kind of scores that make a difference, right, in your um, grade, okay? Another example would be the amount you paid for gas at a gas station would depend on the number of gallons that you pumped, right? So normally in that, uh, that sort of relationship, it would be like what I paid would equal however much the cost was times the gallons pumped, right? I put an extra O in there. It's not balloons, galloons. Okay, but that's a relationship. One times the other gives me how much I would pay. Okay, um, now here's where they start to make a distinction. So a relation can be represented by a set of ordered pairs. Okay, so points are a very good example of ordered pairs. I'm pretty sure in your lifetime, you've seen a point that looks something like this, right? Um, and where the number is represents something, okay? For us and in the future, the first one is always gonna represent your X value. And the second one is always going to represent the Y value. So where that number is matters, right? That's why they call it an ordered pair. Because the first one will always be X and the second value after the comma will always be Y, okay? Well, Anything can be written as points, right? If I tell you the number of gallons I pumped, as soon as I tell you the number of gallons pumped, you know this value, you can multiply it by the cost and then you'll get how much was paid, right? You can always write these relationships as ordered pairs. However, a function is a relation in which for each and every, oh my gosh, the light came off again. <laughs> For each and every distinct value of the first component, there is exactly one value for the second component, okay? And that is why this one is not a function. Now let's look at these two and compare them. So one of them is a function and one of them is not. So no matter what my X value that I plug in here, if I plug in one and I square the one, don't I get a Y value? If I plug in a different X value, like let's say two, and I square it, I get four, right? Every time I plug in a number, I always get one number back, okay? However, over here, what happens if I plug in a number for X? Like let's say I plug in one for X, right? That means this would be Y squared equals one. And how would I figure out what y is? I would have to do square root on both sides, wouldn't I? Which would automatically put in a plus or minus. So then I would get y equals plus or minus one, which means I had one input and somehow I got two outputs. This is the one that is not a function, okay? You plugged in one number, but you didn't get exactly one number back out. You got two numbers back out, okay? So that one is not a function. So I'm gonna go over example one. We only have like four more minutes. This is the only one I'm gonna cover. Um, but in example one, it says, they're giving you these list of ordered pairs. And one of them is called F, one of them is called G, and the other one is called H. And they want you to decide whether these relations are functions or not, okay? 
So next to each one, I'm just gonna either write function or not a function, okay? Now what you're looking for is this situation. You wanna find where you have the same X value, but then two different Y values. Because for each X, we're only supposed to have one Y, okay? Now, if I look here, I only have this X goes to that Y, this X goes to that Y, this X goes to that Y, right? That is totally okay. This one is a function. When I get to this one though, oh gosh, there's three of them that are awful, right? Because you have one X value, one, but it's going to three different numbers, isn't it? That cannot happen. That is not a function, okay? So this one cannot go to one and two and three. This one is not a function. And look at this one, it's doing the same thing, but it's negative two that's the bad guy, right? Notice that it also has two different Y values. So this one is also not a function. Whatever the X is, the X value is, it can only go to one Y value, not two different Y values, okay? Now I'm gonna put this here, but then we're gonna stop, okay? So this is just little boxes if you wanted to fill them in. It says, in a function, no two ordered pairs can have the same X value and different Y values. And that's exactly what was happening here, right? They all had the same X, but different Y values. And then the bottom sentence says, in a function, there is exactly one value of the Y variable or the second component for each value of the X variable or the first component. And they say first component and second component because remember it's ordered pairs, right? The first one is always the X and then the second one is always the Y. Okay, but we'll stop here. You're probably not gonna be able to do too much, maybe like one or two of the problems <laughs> in 2.3. So I would wait on 2.3 until we finish talking about it on Thursday, okay? Um, but if anybody has any questions for me, now you can ask. Um, otherwise, you guys are free to go.